morning, church. I'm super stoked to share this morning. Uh, it's been like, what, three weeks, two weeks since my last, Julie was here and I got to share and then um, I waited a couple weeks and I'm, I'm super stoked. This is a little loud, I think. I don't know, but good? You want to hear me yell? All right. All right, so um, super stoked this morning. I, I always think it's fun to share, but it's also super um, humbling and it, it's a heart check and it, what it does is it forces me to slow down long enough to reflect on what God's doing in my life. And um, that's generally what I end up sharing is just whatever God's doing in my life. And so um, that's what I'm going to do this morning. Without fail, I'm, I'm always reminded that he's, he's working in our hearts and our minds and our lives constantly and continually to glorify himself and refine us. Um, a few weeks back, God started something new in my life, what felt like a new work, but in reflection, it was something that has been bubbling under the surface for a long, long time. And, and finally, it's all come to a head. And um, uh, just to kind of just jump right into it, I, I'm part of the younger generation. And uh, the younger generation deals with anxiety and worry a lot. And um, I mean, our church is pretty young people light. Like, we don't have very many youth. Um, we, I mean, youth as in like my age. Um, so if, I mean, it's a universal human problem, worry, so I'm assuming that I'm safe in talking about worry and anxiety and, and resting in God, so uh, I'll just go for it. So um, I, like I said, being part of the younger generation, dealing with anxiety is something that is almost pandemic um, or epidemic. I don't know what the right word is, but past five, ten years of my life growing up uh, has been marked with the same struggle a lot of young people deal with, and that's, that's worry, that's anxiety. Um, I don't mean the crippling kind of worry that paralyzes you completely from life, although that is common. Um, I, I mean more of a constant, almost imperceptible worry that weighs upon the soul, creating doubt and confusion in the long run. And this, this is not from God. This is definitely not of God or from Him. As we know in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, if the slide can come up, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind, one that does not struggle with anxiety or worry. Well, we're, we're human, right? We're always going to deal with anxiety and worry. But remember what Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. That's a command. Now, it's kind of hard to, like, how do, what do I practically do? I, you know, I really just want just instructions for how to stop worrying about stuff. And it's not, it's not something that you can, you know, just stop doing. It's something that's going to be a work of the spirit day in and day out. You're going to have to rely on him. Say, Lord, here I am. Search me and know me. Here's my anxieties and worries. Help me not to be anxious today. Help me not to worry today. And there are practical steps, I think, that we can do to help ourselves. Um, and I'll get to those. But I, I, when I sat down to kind of prepare, I, I started to ask myself where this worry and anxiety comes from. I think, yeah, it's part of being a human, but, you know, we always have something to worry about. But I noticed there are certain things in life that can fuel it. There are certain things that uh, accentuate it or make it worse. Um, and I call those things distractions, noises. Those are the things that we turn to when we start feeling worried or anxious. We, we turn on the TV to just drown out whatever voices are going on in our minds. We uh, read a, a book or we watch a movie or we listen to music or a podcast or fill in the blank, anything to distract us from the, the constant noise of, of the, it depends on where you are in life and how bad it is, but the, the noise of, of anxiety and worry. Um, I'm not saying that listening to music or podcasts is bad. I'm just saying if we turn to that first and we don't turn to the one voice that matters the most, his voice, um, we find ourselves in a bad place. There's only one voice we need, and that's in, uh, found in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So on a practical point, um, it's only really in the last, like, 100 years or so that we got radio and television, and then in the last 20 years or so that we got Spotify and Instagram and social media and all this this distraction. So even just from a practical standpoint, if you think about it, 
humanity is, this is relatively new to the scene of having something we can just turn to immediately. Pulling out our phone and in three seconds we're completely bombarding our minds with, with loud noise. Um, you know, our ancestors, they would work in the field all day, most of our ancestors at least, would work in the field all day and, and they were forced to just be quiet and be still. And it wasn't something they really had to try hard to do. But we, on the other hand, you know, we have found a way to drown out that the still small voice of the Holy Spirit through distractions. Um, so on a practical standpoint, we can help ourselves out a little bit by weeding out some of the noise. Take uh, practical steps, remove those loud noises from your life, and replace them with new ones. Fill up on a good thing instead. For example, I, uh, I work outside. I cut grass and um, do landscaping for a living, and I, when I first started, I was using just earmuffs to just make it quiet because all my power machinery was really loud, and I didn't want to destroy my eardrums. So I decided I'll destroy my eardrums another way, get Bluetooth headphones and listen to music on the highest volume possible. But then I realized, you know, obviously got to turn it down a little bit. But I still, for the last like year or so, I've, I've been, you know, got noise going in my, my ears the entire day, voices of of music or of podcasts, listening to, to political podcasts or just entertainment or whatever it was. And each day at the end of the day, I'd go home, driving home, and I'd ask myself, why do I feel terrible? Why do I feel like I can't think straight? And I don't know if it's just having an IQ of like 20 or if it's just being young and dumb, having fun. I would just not associate, oh, I just listened to someone talk about how wrong the left wing is for like six hours straight. That that. I mean, the left wing is wrong, I'm just saying, but it doesn't help to have six hours of Ben Shapiro talking at, you know, two times speed and you have to slow him down. It, the point is, is I had distractions. I had noise, the constant buzz in my, in my mind. And instead, you know, and, and I would, I would listen to the Bible app, you know, one or two hours or whatever, but I should have been filling up on a good thing, like Philippians 4, 8 says. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Um, you know, it not necessarily was wrong to listen to political podcasts or it wasn't wrong to listen to secular music. To, it's not gangster rap trash, whatever, just, you know. It wasn't virtuous, it wasn't good report, it wasn't lovely and pure and holy and just. It wasn't things I should be thinking on as much as I was. And so that's my practical example of, of how to remove, you know, some of these loud voices that we don't necessarily need. There's a time in life and repeating times, I think, that we should spend in quiet, in, in stillness, in just listening and resting. And so... I've titled this message, Rest Here, um, because the first half of it, I, I'm t I've been talking about how all the voices and the noises and how we need to weed those things out and the practical steps, but what's the, what's the end goal? What are we trying to achieve by doing this? Is it just to have some sort of inner peace? Yes. But is it, it's, it's more than that. It's a, we're, we're trying to strive after a relationship of rest and, and to set the stage, to paint the backdrop for it, we need peace and not chaos. And so that was the practical examples, but I want to talk about the heart behind it. David, the psalmist, says in chapter 23, verse 2 of Psalms, says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Oh, I see, I accidentally, uh, now you guys know what I'm going to say. Great. Um, that's, not, that's not the Bible in there. I accidentally added some stuff. The Bible is saying, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh. He makes us do it. Sometimes we're forced to rest. And you can see the punchline already. But, uh, you know, if you get sick in bed and you're like, Man, I hate being sick. This is the worst. It is the worst, you know. Uh, but you're probably not going to die. So take the time to just rest. And don't binge watch all the X-Men movies like I did last time I got sick. I don't regret it. You know, I learned a lot. I'm cultured, um, but it's, it's the, the, the idea of, of being forced to lay down. Sometimes we work ourselves into a frenzy. Sometimes we worry ourselves into a, into a, a frenzy, and we just need to be made to lay down. You know, sheep are stubborn creatures, and 
they are sometimes they need to be forced to lay down so they can rest and sit by, beside the still waters. And, and I think that's why God compares us to sheep. It's because we're stubborn. And it's true. Psalms 46.10. Let's see if any more of my notes snuck in here. Yes, sweet. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. It's a command. It says be still. Be still and know that I am God. This is all a part of resting. This is, this is why I titled it Rest Here. At the feet of the Father, at the still waters and the green pastures, rest here. So like I said, this was something about two or three weeks ago, God started doing it in my, my life. He started showing me what it looks like to rest. And he started prompting me to weed out some of the noises and to replace them. And um, what happens when we begin to make progress? The devil hates it. He hates when the Christian life begins to succeed or flourish or grow. He wants to disrupt it with temptation and doubt. And oftentimes, a lot of our temptations just come from our own flesh, right? Uh, James tells us that, you know, you're led away, but led away by your own lusts, your own desires. But um, John 10, 10, Jesus tells us that the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So we see two sides of the spectrum. We see the devil on one side, Christ on the other. Christ wants to give us life and life more abundant than we've ever had it before. And the enemy, he just wants to destroy any work of God that he can. Um, so what happens when we, when we make a mistake, when we, we slip and fall? It's not unlike throwing a, a, a big brick, a rock, into a, a serene pond. You know, the serene pond being our life and resting with God. We make a mistake, and it, it comes into immediate chaos. Big, wide ripples ripple out and affect all areas of our lives. But does it continue to rage? No, it, it, will, it will calm down again. You know, don't despair. I mean, don't continue to sin. Oh, I sinned once. I may as well just keep throwing rocks in the pond until it's just com completely destroyed. No, with time, it settles again. Um, of course, in this analogy, it comes as a, a result of repentance and forgiveness. We need to turn to the Father and make right with Him. But sometimes there are long-lasting consequences to sin. I think all of us know that. We've all experienced it. Um, we must endure them, the, the, the ripples in the pond. Um, and then there's one other thing. I was sharing this at youth group on Friday, and uh, it's always fun sharing with the youth group because it's, you just learn to expect it to, to just be different than sharing with the congregation. It's kind of like my, my guinea pig. And then I, I work out, okay, that was, that's a good question. That's something I need to address. I shouldn't say that because that's just immature, you know. Whatever, but um, I was sharing, and, and one of the youth students, Brett, actually, he's like, oh, you know what's a good extra added part to the analogy is when you throw the rocks and all the frogs leave, and those are the people in your life. Like, dude, you're destroying your life. I don't want to be around you. So, you know, stop throwing rocks in the pond and let the frogs come back. And there, you guys all just got compared to frogs. Um, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that. It made me laugh, and uh, I, I told Brett I'd put it in there and, you know, drop his Instagram handle or whatever. Just kidding. Um, man, there's definitely not enough young people in, in this congregation. They would have laughed at that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the heart of it is that we, we're made for relationship. We're made for a relationship of rest, a relationship of just leaning up against Jesus and, and resting in his arms. Um, and so wherever you are in your life, get alone with God and get real with God. I'll always, always say that is get real with God because he already knows your heart. Tell him exactly the way it is. If you're, you're just doing all right, if you're terrible, if you're doing great, whatever it is. Uh, Psalms 37, verse 7, uh, the psalmist says this. He says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked, wicked devices to pass. That first part, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Uh, that's a... It's an admonishment. It's an encouragement. It's a, it's a reminder to himself. I, I think of the Psalms as sort of like a, a personal journal for David, you know, from the time he was a young shepherd and the songs that he wrote in Psalms 23, he maketh me lie down, um, all the way up to the end when he was 
older and, and the time in between when he was on the run, this is a personal reminder to himself to rest in the Lord and to wait patiently for him. And then 100 chapters later in Psalms chapter 130, verse 5, he, he, he says that he's doing it. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. So David is taking his own advice. He, maybe, I don't know, maybe he was up late at night one day and he's just having a hard day. And he, he's reading back on some of his old journal entries. And, it, oh, yes, rest in the Lord. And the Holy Spirit just drew it out and showed it to him. And he's like, yes, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. Um, I've got this friend in Oahu. Uh, his name is Joe Mike. I, I miss him. He's, he's a good guy. And um, we had a lot of good memories. But um, back when I was in Oahu a couple years ago, I remember there was like a there was like a Thanksgiving meal or something, and and he was coming, and then I was I was going into the house, and I saw him outside, just kind of like sitting on the curb, just uh, he looked overwhelmed, and I didn't want to bother him right away. But later, uh, the next couple days later, I talked to him about. It. I was like, hey man, what's going on? Like you're right, and he just shared like, yeah, I just had a really long day, you know, we we just lots of uh, interruptions and frustrations, and I was just a little bit overwhelmed. I was a little bit anxious. I was a little bit worried. I'm, well, not a little bit. I was, I was very overwhelmed, and I just, I didn't know what to do, so I just sat down on that curb, and I was just breathing, and um, he told me uh, over dinner that night, talking about it, you know, if you ever feel that same way, if you ever feel overwhelmed in life, if you ever feel like the anxieties and troubles and worries of this life are starting to make you despair and um, be overwhelmed, sit down somewhere. Find a nice barren curb and just sit with the Lord. <laughs> Breathe deep. And remind yourself that God has got it all figured out. And simply rest in him. And, and it's that heart that he was sharing that echoes the verse in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. It says, Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Reminds me of what Peter said to Jesus when Jesus asked him, Are you too going to leave? Are you, are you going to leave with these other people who are turning away from me? And, and Peter says, Lord, to whom else will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Like, that's our, that should be our response. God, like, I don't have another hope. If it's not you, it's no one. It's nothing. I'm hopeless without you. And thank God that he's always there. Thank God that he is the, the God of hope, the God of peace and joy and consolation. The God of consolation, that, that was something that came up a couple days ago. And um, When we suffer loss in life, consolation is someone who comforts you after suffering loss. Um, the God of consolation. He's always there. So in closing, life is loud. Um, there are many voices, many distractions. It doesn't need to be as loud as it is. We can, we can ask ourselves, okay, which voices can I actively remove or avoid? Which ones are worth listening to? And which voices, for, for how long should I listen to these voices? So my encouragement to us as a church, as individuals, is to search our hearts let us ask God for direction. Um, and as we wait on him, the way David said, I wait on the Lord. Let's sit at his feet, lean against him, and rest here. Thank you, church.